Everybody is doing good. Are you having fun? Are you enjoying the weather? It finally rained yesterday. Yes. Oh, I it, wanted to show it. Rainy today. It like, is raining also. Rainy today. Thankfully. So I wanted to share something uh, that I got from my garden yesterday. Uh huh. Very nice. Beautiful. Oh, they are from your garden? They are from my garden. Wonderful, I, wonderful. Yeah. Wow. So I'm going to take a picture of this and send it to you so you can paint it if you like. Oh, there's Dolly. Very nice. Dolly, are you going to come on? I'm taking this picture. All right. Recently, I've been attempting to grow an apple tree. I started a few weeks ago. You did? Oh, yeah. And, and uh, I just pulled apple seeds out of apples. That's awesome. But um, uh, you know, if you try try doing a growing a cherry tree, uh, not a cherry peach tree. So if you grow a peach tree, it's uh, true to it's like if you eat a peach. Try to grow the peach tree from that peach. If it's really nice and sweet, it'll turn out to be the exact same. Apparently, with apple trees, if you grow it from seed, sometimes it's it's a completely different apple because most apples are hybridized. Okay, I'm trying to grow cherry trees. So look at that. We are all experimenting and we are having fun. Isn't that so cool. I started a few wow. weeks ago. I don't think this seed is actually working, although yeah. it might be because I forgot to water it for about a week or two. Well, just continue to water it. All right, so how's everyone doing? I'm going to share the screen. Today, I'm going to talk about Michelangelo. Michelangelo Bonarotti. He has a long name, but he was a genius as well, okay? He was a Renaissance era painter, sculptor, poet, and architect. And the nice thing, I mean, I just calculated, uh, like he was born in 1475, so it was about 540 plus years ago. So imagine that most of his work has been documented from the 16th century and it's well documented. So he was one of those people whose biography was um, written while he was still alive. So somebody else uh, wrote his biography and then he wrote his own biography. So uh, a lot of his work still remains um, well preserved till today, okay? He learned to work with marble a chisel and a hammer as, as a young child in a stone quarry that his father owned. So the story is that after he was born in 1475 in Florence, Italy, his mother died when he was just about six years old. So then he was raised in, on, on this um, stone quarry by his um, governor, but the stone quarry was owned by his father. He, the, he came from noble, um, uh, you know, uh, he was kind of a nobleman. So, but so from nobility to become an artist is like going from being a king to be a knight, you know, you're going down. So at first his father was not very happy that he wanted to be an artist, but then later on he just said, okay, well, you know, go ahead and be the artist that you want to be. So on the stone quarry, his governess, so his husband, was a stone quarry person. So he learned how to chisel and carve stones since he was very, very young, okay? So he spent time in Florence, Bologna, and Rome. He died at the age of 88 in 1564. In your PowerPoint, I made a little typo and it says 1864. So that has to be changed to 1564. Imagine that he would have been 388 or something, if that were true. And that's not true. Okay, so let's move on. Where did he get educated? Now, some of us over here, even in this group, probably don't like school, right? But some of us love school. But those of you who don't like school, that's all right too. But but you know, 
it is, it is, I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to school, but it's okay if you really don't like school. Make sure you like something and then that you're good at something. So uh, even though he was put in grammar school, he just said, um, you know, he didn't want to. So his father said, okay, he has to go and he has to go and study with this guy. His name is Domenico Ghirlandaio. Now, uh, Domenico Ghirlandaio was a very well-known sculptor and artist of his time at that, you know, in, uh, during 1488. So at the age of 13, he went and he started um, working for this famous sculptor and painter. Then in 1490 to 92, he attended a, an academy. Then he worked for another sculptor by the name of Bertoldo Giovanni, okay? But you know, at uh, when he was working for Domenico, by one after one year, like at age fourteen, he said, "Well, I don't have anything more to learn." So he moved on. And uh, what happened was there was this guy by the name of Lorenzo the Great. He was sort of like a king uh, of the Medici, and he took him under his wing and. Um, he commissioned a lot of pieces through, uh, so he started working for Lorenzo the Great at the age of 14, okay? So under Bertoldo, this uh, Giovanni, he produced the Battle of Centaurs and Madonna of the Stairs. And then he left Bologna to go to Florence, Italy. So let's look at some of his very famous um, paintings first. Even though, like, let me tell you, Michelangelo considered himself to be a sculptor, not a painter. He was a sculptor. So let's look at one of his masterpieces. This is, this is the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. So imagine when we paint, we paint like this, right? We're painting like this. But imagine if we had to paint lying down and looking up. Can you imagine that? This is what he did. So all of the ceiling was painted by him, lying down and looking up, okay? So a lot of pain got into his eyes. There were times when he couldn't see very well, but then, you know, then he had to rest and then he would come back to work again. There is, there is a very nice movie uh, that was made about this process. Uh, it's an old movie, it's, I will send you the name of the movie in my email it's called agony and ecstasy if you have a chance to watch it please watch it and um uh but anyway so what happened there is like you know how all of us are very competitive some of us are very competitive so there was this architect uh in vatican at the time and uh he wanted to get the commission of the tomb of pope louis the second Okay, he was the Pope at the time. And the Pope uh, gave the commission of making the tomb for him to Michelangelo. He was a young guy at the time and the architect was really upset. So what did he do? He was being a little mean and he said, okay, I'm going to convince the Pope to uh, let Michelangelo do something that he can't do. He knew that he couldn't paint, so he, told the Pope, tell him to paint the ceiling. And that's what the Pope said, go ahead and paint the ceiling. And Michelangelo didn't want to paint the ceiling because he just wanted to sculpt. He was a sculptor. But then uh, uh, the Pope Julius II, he said, no, paint the ceiling. And Pope Julius II and Michelangelo had very hot tempers. They would fight with each other and, you know, Sometimes uh, Michelangelo, there was a time when he ran away and went up to the mountains and then, uh, you know, and then he came back and Pope Julius would say, what were you doing? He said, I went to think, you know. So th there are a lot of little stories like that. I wish I knew more stories to tell you about these two people who were great in their own way, but they had hot tempers. They were like, you know, mad at each other and you know and so forth but then he said okay i'll paint the ceiling and he took up this challenge and when they unveiled it after four years he worked on the ceiling for four years there are 
some 343 figures on the ceiling, okay? When they unveiled it, it was so beautiful that people called him Il Divino, meaning the divine one. And once he did this, I mean, it was just, everybody said he's the greatest artist alive. So, I mean, uh, Da Vinci was alive at the time still, but they thought that Michelangelo was phenomenal, okay? So what is there in this uh, ceiling, the Sistine Chapel ceiling? There, there are nine stories of the book of Genesis and uh, from the Old Testament. So the story goes that Michelangelo read the Old Testament many times over to come up with the ideas for all the paintings. So you see, whenever you do some work, okay, you have to research about it. You have to think about it. And there's a lot of thought that needs to go into something that you love. For, for instance, like Jareth. Jareth is growing an apple tree. Jareth, I want you to go and look at how to grow apple trees, you know? Go and research it, learn about it, and then uh, do your thing, okay? It doesn't matter what you're interested in, but if you're interested in something that, that moves you, go ahead and research it, because that's what all these famous people did. They work okay? So uh, let's move on to the next uh, thing, this one. This is Donny Tondo, and it was done. It's called a Holy Family. It was um, uh, painted in 1506. It's, it is now can be viewed in the Uppizzi in Florence, Italy. It's an oil uh, and tempera on a panel, okay? And um, there are, like, if you look at this, so Holy Family, so these are all very religious figures, right? The Holy Family has been painted many times by many people. But in this case, it is it's, it's different. Here Mary is in the foreground and she is sitting sort of like Joseph is kind of protecting. And now can you tell me whether Mary is handing Jesus to Joseph or Joseph is handing Jesus to Mary? Does anybody, can anybody weigh in on that? What do you think? Any any ideas? Mary's handing Joseph to, I mean. Just to Joseph, you think? Both, both are. Both, yeah. But who is, so there is a big debate about who is. I think Mary is giving him up. Mary is giving him to Joseph. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. but now, if you look at it, see, I mean, in the background, there's not very much there. There's a little bit of hint of a mountains over there. Here is. Yes. John the Baptist, he's looking mm -hmm. up. Most of the time when the Holy Family was painted, they would like John the Baptist there. And then in the back, there are these naked figures, and we don't know what it is. But see, they are not looking at the Holy Family. They are kind of conversing to each other. When you look at the painting, there's perspective. Like, you know, when you look at the painting, it seems like you're go looking in. He did that by making a semicircular ledge, sort of. So that's, you know, like I said, each painting, scholars look at it and peer over it and study it and spend hours talking about painting. And we are talking about so many 15, 20 paintings in like 30 minutes. So that's not even possible. Um, so anyway, let's move on to the next. This is, this is part of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. It's called the Cleo of Adam. Okay, it's called the creation of Adam. It's in the Vatican. And what is shown over here, this particular figure, this region right here, the hands, have been copied by many artists. Many, many people have copied it. Okay, what is God doing? God made man in his image. That's what the Old Testament says. So God is reaching out and he's touching Adam, you know, and he made him in his figure. You see? And so people will think that, okay, well, why did he paint all these nude people? It's a church, you know? So to that, like Michelangelo said, that's the purest form of the person. So uh, God made him in his own image and it's beautiful. So there's nothing to be ashamed of 
that, oh, this is, these people are all naked. No, there's nothing to be ashamed of that. That's what his thing was. And I'll tell you another funny story later on, okay? So here, in the last judgment, this is, um, this is uh, just a portion of the last judgment. And uh, this is just a small portion of it. There's a huge, big, this last judgment is a whole big panel in one, one side of the church. And uh, um, what do you call it? He, um, he uh, this, this painting was done after the Sistine Chapel. So if you will see, there are about 20 seated naked males. Nobody knows the significance of the naked uh, males. And they call them the ignudi. Ignudi means naked people. So perhaps these naked people represent angels that are watching all the events of, you know, um, uh, what's going on in the paintings and, uh, you know, while the Bible scenes are depicted. But this is one of the 20 uh, seated nude males. Now, if you look at this, this painting is called The Drunkenness of Noah. Do you guys remember uh, the Noah's Ark, the story of the Noah's Ark? Remember, there was a huge deluge. In the, this is biblical. So where it rained for 40 days and 40 nights continuously, and the world was underwater. And the only people that survived was Noah and his ark and all the animals that were in the ark with him together. But here they showed Noah and his three sons. The three sons are like, oh my gosh, they are looking at their dad and thinking so sad, you know, he's drunk and, uh, and so forth. And Noah is asleep and he's mocked by the sons. And this is the first fresco when you enter the chapel through the east door of the Vatican. This is the deluge. This is again, part of the deluge. This is not the whole painting, but uh, the whole painting is a little bit bigger, but there's the Noah's Ark and all these people who were uh, fleeing the rain with their possessions and everything, they, they all perished. The only people that survived was Noah and the animals and so forth. That's what the uh, painting is all about. It's the eighth scene of the uh, Sistine Chapel ceiling. In this um, painting, it's called the first day of creation. There is light and there's darkness. So this is the first day of creation. And then, then he created light. That's what they say. So God divides light from darkness. And it, this, this painting was the last painting to be painted. But this figure of God, like God was painted in just one day. In one day, he painted this figure. That's a phenomenal uh, thing, I think, because uh, that's, that's really fast to do that painting in just one day. If you look at this one, this, this is the prophet Jeremiah. It was, uh, it's again in the Vatican in Rome. Vatican is the um, richest church on the planet. Uh, and, uh, this one is on the left side of the high altar. Here he's seen lost in meditation. Uh, and he's kind of sad, right? If you look at it. And uh, people say that this is a self-portrait of Michelangelo himself. And he's lamenting over his sins. Like he's just lamenting. Like he's sitting there thinking. And they think that this is Michelangelo's self-portrait. Oh, here's the last judgment, the whole piece. So earlier on, I showed you just this piece right here. Okay, just this little piece. So over here, there are about 300 figures in this, uh, in this piece. And it's the second coming of Christ. This, the last judgment is supposed to be the second coming of Christ. There are about 300 people here. And there's Mary right next to Jesus. And um, one a notable thing in this painting is that all the males are naked, but the females are clad, okay? And what happened was, Pope, uh, 
Pope Paul III's master of ceremonies, his name was Sasena. When he looked at it, he was like, what? this is blasphemous. You know, in a church, you have all this nudity and everything. How is that even possible? So he went and he told the Pope, he said, this is not on. Like, you know, he's, uh, this is such a blasphemous thing. It is not nice for a church to have all this kind of nudity inside the church. So what did Michelangelo do? He went and painted one of the, uh, uh, the uh, he painted Sathena into one of the uh, people and he gave him these donkey ears and then he covered his, uh, you know, uh, covered him with a, what do you call it, a coiled snake. The donkey's ears because he said he was so foolish, okay? So because he didn't understand the art. So that's what he did, despite Sasena. But Pope, John, Pope Paul, he said, well, you know, this was done after Julius, Pope Julius, okay? Uh, so um, Pope Paul said, well, I don't have jurisdiction in hell. So let the painting stay the way it is. So that's what we had. So the painting is there just the way we are. So just like today, like, you know, when we get mad at people, we sometimes fight them. It was not different even in those days. People fight, you know, people did things to each other just to spite, spite them. And it's kind of funny when you think about it. In here, this is the crucifixion of St. Peter. One of the nice things uh, one of the, this is kind of a sad painting right here, the way a Peter uh, is crucified on the cross and the way he's angled is kind of different. But in here, see this picture right here? If you, um, if you go in the corner, there is a gentleman with a red tunic and a blue turban. That is Michelangelo. So in those days, people used to put themselves into paintings. This has happened with many, many painters. They would make their little self-portrait and put themselves in the paintings, you know? So here, Michelangelo put himself at the corner looking into this. So that is really very nice. And then again, there is again, to create perspective, he's just given a little bit of blue mountains in the back and he layered it, but not too many trees and nothing much so that the whole, uh, what do you call it, concentration or attention of the painting goes right to the center on St. Peter and everybody else is looking in. So what do you notice from all of these paintings? Okay, yes, he was a Renaissance era painter, but during the Renaissance, he painted people with a lot of expression. So a new um, era or a new art form, uh, uh, came about. It's called mannerism during the Renaissance. This is called mannerisms. So see, everybody's like anguished faces and the mannerisms are captured by Michelangelo really, really well. Okay. So this is, um, this is something you will take note of. Now let's move on over here. Again, this is another famous painting of his. It's called The Torment of St. Anthony. And it was made in 1487 to 88. And it's in the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. So what is amazing about this painting is that Michelangelo created this painting when he was 12 to 13 years of age. Can you imagine that? He was only 12 to 13 years. So you see this uh, scenery behind? Where else have you seen sceneries? If you looked at Mona Lisa, uh, which was a, a Leonardo da Vinci painting, they painted Mona Lisa and in the background was a scene, right? So what did um, Michelangelo do? He also put sceneries and this is the Arno Valley, the landscape of the Arno River Valley. Okay, so this is in the background. Now, if he was only 12 or 13, can you imagine? People say, that he used to visit, visit the fish markets. Why? Because he wanted to paint these monsters very realistically looking like animals. So he used to visit the fish markets and he studied the scales of the fish. And look at this painting over here. 
look at like you know how the fish scales are so vivid right so even at the age of 12 or 13 he was researching he actually wanted to study what he was painting and if you let's go back to these um, let's go back to this painting right here okay this is one of the nudos what do you see you see that he has a very good uh, you know understanding of the human body like you can see all the muscles being depicted like you can see like you know everything being depicted so exceedingly well which is amazing here's another painting i wanted to show you in this adam has an extra pair of ribs see over here he didn't do it because he didn't know that this is just not right but whereas this was the rib that eve was made out of and he put that in his painting so he actually researched the subjects extremely well you know so there we go again 12 to 13 years of age and he comes up with this painting so he truly was a very gifted soul now i told you in the beginning that michelangelo was not a painter he was not a painter he was a sculptor and he loved to sculpt so if you look at this he sculpted david now david is like over 17 feet tall just imagine that would be like two and a half times a seven foot man if there was a seven foot man right so 17 feet tall and six and a half feet wide so this dimension from here to here is about six and a half feet wide and there's a story about david too okay so this mar this piece of marble was a marble uh, that was in the vatican for about a hundred years there was a, uh, there was a um there was a uh, culture okay let me turn it off hold on that Okay, I'm going to mute everybody so that, yes, okay. So, uh, uh, so David, so this piece of, this marble was a Carrera marble, and it was uh, one of the finest marbles. But unfortunately, it was there for 100 years because there was a sculptor by the name of Master Agostino. And what he had done is he blocked the piece of marble, meaning he carved out some things off the marble, and it was, it was a really shabby job really bad job and nobody thought anything could be done with it so what he, what happened was michelangelo he was only like very very young 24 or 24 yeah he was just 24 and he said you know he convinced the pope that give me the marble i'll do something with it and then in four years he carved this gorgeous statue of david out of it and people thought it was just miraculous it's a miracle that somebody could do something with that useless piece of marble that was laying in there for a hundred years. And here comes young Michelangelo. He was only 24. He convinces the Pope to give him that piece of marble and he carves David out of it. So you see, it is just amazing what he has done here. And another piece of his sculpture that I wanted to show you is the Pieta. The Pieta was done in 1498 to 99. This, this piece, okay, there's another story about this piece too. So let, before I tell you the story, let's look at how the sculpture is, okay? So you'll see that it's like a triangular form, right? Mary's face is up on top. Mary's face is very young. And, but Jesus was about 30, 33, I think, when he was crucified. And this is when Jesus was taken down from the cross, Mary is holding him in his arms, okay? That's the Pieta. But then he made Mary's face very young instead of a 50-year-old person, very young. And the reason why he said that is that Mary was so pure that, you know, she just had to have that pure young face. That's why he made her look 
that young. And that this Pira has been done by other people as well. But this is Michelangelo's version where Mary is very young here. Okay. And uh, you would see that all of these like garments, the way they are, you know, the flowing, this is made out of marble. You know, he chiseled out all these pieces. This piece was commissioned by Cardinal Bill Harris. Okay. And uh, the way he wanted to do it is that he said, I want to carve this image from the heart. So it's the heart's image in this. And you can see it, it's just a gorgeous piece of sculpture. So, um, so once, so the story about this piece is that, you know, when it was being displayed, uh, people came in and so, you know, like if I went to see the Piera and I said, oh, was this piece made by the sculptor? And there was another sculptor by the name of Solari. So did, did Solari make this sculpture? Some of the people were saying. And Michelangelo overheard that and he said, what? That's not right. So this is the only piece he signed. And he signed it because he overheard other people thinking that this is Solari sculpture. So he went ahead and signed the piece. So that's the only piece of sculpture that Michelangelo signed, only because he wanted to make sure that people thought that this is not Solari's piece, this is my piece, and he went and signed it, okay? So this is why I tell you, whenever you do a piece of work, go ahead and sign it and own it and that it is yours, okay? Here's another sculpture that was made in 1513. It's a very, very large piece. It's uh, called Moses. It's right now in Vincoli, Rome, in Italy. And he made Moses here with horns. Why would a person have horns? Hi, Will. Are you done? Uh, it's good to see Will. He's come back from his appointment. Well, okay, so why does he have horns? So what did, what did I tell you uh, earlier? I said that um, Michelangelo researched his subjects. Like when he made the Sistine Chapel, he had researched and read the, um, the Old Testament a lot of times. Similarly, when he made Moses, he uh, described it as, um, it is uh, described it in, in chapter 34 in Exodus that Moses had horns. So he put horns on him. That's how it is. Then Vasari was one of his biographers. And the way he described this image of Moses is that, he says, just look at his beard. This is his long beard, right? Moses' long beard. I mean, it looks like a painting. So he was saying that the iron chisel that he used to carve out Moses was like a brush. So he took a brush and he just painted the hair in it. It's that fine. I'm sure it looks amazing right in person. So that's how gorgeous all these works are, of art are. Here is another uh, famous sculpture. It's uh, called the Madonna of the Bruges. It's uh, present in Bruges, Belgium. It was done in 1504. It's about the virgin and child. But, you know, virgin and child have been uh, painted and sculpted in a lot of history. But in here, Michelangelo painted it uh, sculpted it differently. Here, uh, the Virgin, Mother Mary, is not holding on to baby Jesus. She's just kind of holding her just a little right here, you know, and uh, Jesus is kind of stepping down from Mary, and Mary is looking away. So that's how the sculpture was done. And this was, you know, uh, Hitler had um, done a lot of brutalities during the World Wars, and um, so people had, uh, he had confiscated this particular sculpture as well. But in The Monuments Men, which is another movie I would like for you to watch, The Monuments Men, Men went and rescued her just in time before the German people were going to come and bomb the place that had all these treasures and paintings there. I would love for you to see this particular movie as well. I will send that information to you in the email. Okay, last but not the least, this is San Spirito uh, Crucifix. It's, uh, it's present in the church in 
Florence, Italy. Okay. So what happened was, remember I told you that at, at the age of 15, he went off to work for Lorenzo the Great. He was a, in Medici. So Lorenzo the Great died. Okay. So at that time, that, that was his, his um, mentor and his benefactor. So he would pay him, right? So now he did not have a mentor. There was nobody to commission works for him. So he had to come back to Florence and he was a guest at the St. Maria del Santo Spirito Church for about a year. And so over there, all these corpses would come, you know, for, for burial, people would bury them, you know. So he asked the church if he could you know, study the cadavers. You know what a cadaver is? Cadavers are uh, corpses or dead bodies. So he wanted to study the human body. So he went ahead and studied the human body, okay? So that was one of the stories. So instead of not doing anything for them, he was only 17 years old when he sculpted this crucifix. And here again, Jesus is shown as naked. But if you look at all the other churches, you will see that Jesus has a loincloth on it. But in the Bible, the real story is that the people, the Romans, they took all the clothing, stripped Jesus of all his clothing. It was very sad. They took off all his clothing and distributed them and tore it and everybody took a piece of it. And so he depicted Jesus the way it was depicted in the Bible, in the gospels, okay? so. Uh, we want you to uh, know that as well. Another thing, remember I told you that now he's studying cadavers as a young 17-year-old in this church, the San Spirit Maria del Santo Spirito Church. Okay, so I wanted to show you, let me see if I can show you this picture right here. Let me see if I have that. This is the creation of Adam, right? So in 1990, there was a journal article published in JAMA, which is the uh, Journal of American Medicine, uh, you know, and he was a doctor from Indiana, Indiana. And he hypothesized that, see these figures right around God? He said, this is an exact copy of the brain. I have to read that article just to figure out, you know? And then, then again, it is postulated that this red piece is the uterus, the birth of the man. And this green whale right here is the umbilical cord that is cut off. And now I have to study more about this because I, I have to literally go back and check the papers for, you know, how did they postulate? So like I told you, you know, it's not enough to just look at a painting, look at it and study it. And, you know, there, there is more to it that meets the eye, much more to it. That's why people and art history majors and all spend so much time studying just one little thing. So I, in, uh, I invite you to whatever it is that you do in your life. Now, like I said, I love quotes from the master. So these are some of his quotes. And I think it is applicable even now. One of them is, draw Antonio. Antonio was one of his apprentices. Draw Antonio, draw Antonio, draw, and don't waste time, okay? So well, what is he saying? Practice, 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 and don't waste time. So a good painting, he says, is the kind that looks like a sculpture, okay? So what did I tell you before? When you draw something, keep drawing layers and layers and layers and layers on it so that the painting then develops really well, okay? So don't just stop at the first layer. Go ahead and add more and more and develop it like, so that it looks like a sculpture. And then the other thing he said was, if people knew how hard I worked for my mastery, it wouldn't seem so wonderful at all. So you see, it doesn't come, uh, talent is not a inborn ability. You've got to work on it. You may have some inborn ability, 
but it doesn't matter. You have to keep working on it to do well. Hi, Sant. Yes. Can I uh, give another example, which uh, is very similar to what you just mentioned here? Okay. So I, I, I was learning photography, you know, um, a few years back, and I, I also used to, I had a friend who was a great photographer. And I always used to wonder, and this was before the digital cameras were there. So he, he will, you know, come out, uh, go out for a trip, and then come back with great pictures. Right. And I was always surprised, how, how could he get some, some great pictures every time? Yeah. So I asked him, I said, how do you do it? Um, he said, it's not that I get every picture perfect. He said, I take about 50 rolls of film with me. And out of that, I may get 10 pictures that I finally select, pick, and work with. So everything else, nobody even has seen it. Yeah. So it, it is like you were mentioning, um, it, it is not that you, you're you going to try once and you're going to get it. Uh, you're going to continue to work on it and refine it. And many times you're going to pick the best and that's what people see. Yes. Um, and, and that becomes the uh, reflection of how good they are. But it is a lot of effort that goes in uh, to, to come to that point. Yes. Thank you, Ajay. That was a fantastic um, a story to share. And, and you, you know, like there was a, a time when I went and um, listened to one of the National Geographic photographers. And they take thousands of pictures, thousands of pictures, and you will see one that'll be the one that makes the National Geographic magazine. So the thing that we want to tell all you young people and the older people in this particular class is that you can never stop learning and you have to keep keep at it as much as you can okay then another thing that he said was a man paints with his brains and not his hands so utilize your intellect in whatever it is that you do there is no greater harm than the the time that is wasted there is no greater harm than that of time wasted. So don't waste your time, do something, okay? And genius is eternal patience. You've got to be patient with yourself, okay? And I am still learning. He was 88 and he was still learning. So remember, there is never a time that you can stop learning, okay? So today what we want to do is I have a small little thing over here you can print this out. It's a, um, it's the creation of Adam, and there's like these colors. You can take it and do a color by number project for yourself. Okay, and for fun, I want you to take a bar of soap. Okay, go into your mom's closet or your dad's closet and just get a bar of soap and carve in it with, uh, with a little. A knife, not a real knife, but like a, a little butter knife, carve out anything that you can and see how Michelangelo would have carved David out of that piece of marble. You know, marble is very easy to chisel. It's not very hard. So you can chisel out and, you know, I mean, it is hard, but not as hard. So, but the, so you can carve out something from soap and see if you can uh, give it to me like take a picture of it and give it to me by the end of this uh, session and send a picture of it, okay? So one of the fun facts is he imagined an angel and carved out the angel until it was set free. Marble was easy to carve, okay? And this is like, think about a seven-year-old Michelangelo carving marble. He used to carve when he was uh, very, very little. And the painting in the background over here is uh, Amazon want to learn more about it you can go to that website but today let's let's draw okay can we draw like Michelangelo so I want you to so remember in the uh, creation of Adam this is how like the the way they showed the, the picture is like like this right so today I want you to carve something like this hold your hand up like this right in front of you yeah, like hold it to the side, take a picture, and try to um, try to uh, draw your hand like this. Okay, and then once you've drawn, so I just want you to draw from the forearm, like from here on up. 
two straight. So what, what I would do is I would do two straight lines like that for the wrist. And then for each shape, you do it very slowly. Don't do it fast. So from here, you, you'll see a little shape and it's going at a certain angle. So draw that angle first, okay? And slowly keep going up and keep drawing it in small little portions and then collect the, connect the dots, then connect the dots, okay? And yesterday I sent you, uh, what do you call it? A um, couple of videos in which one of the videos is where this girl has drawn a hand and shaded it in, okay? So try to use those techniques, like all the four shading techniques and see, first I would do, like see for this particular portion of the arm, I would do the little contours, like the little circular shading techniques. So that mimics the skin of the, uh, skin of the arm, the soft skin. And then you kind of slowly put in like some of these hashtag, you know, um, shading techniques over here. And then slowly make this, try to make this. I'll try it too, because I haven't done it myself. And then let's share that, okay? I'm gonna unmute all of you. And um, let me see if you have any questions. Do you have any questions? Anybody with any questions? Um, so, with, like the carving the soap thing, yeah, are we like able to use like maybe an exacto knife or whatever, since it has more of that yeah, pointed I mean, blade? Yeah, I so long as your parents allow you to use an exacto knife, go ahead and use an exacto knife. It's it'd be a fun experiment to do. Um, just be careful with the knives and you know, little like try to. Because it's a bar of soap, the exacto knife may be a little too um, harsh. Like, you know, you may chisel off a lot more soap than you need to. So start with first a butter knife and then chisel off. And then once you're, you have a small shape, go ahead and use an exacto knife for like really nice, um, you know, like the fine, fine points. Yeah, for the smaller details. Yeah. That'll be so much fun. I never thought, I mean, I actually, uh, Google to find out, you know, how can I uh, teach Michelangelo to children? And this was one of the projects that they said, go ahead and use a bar of soap and carve out something. I thought that was so brilliant. I wouldn't have thought about it myself. So, um, yeah. So try that. And then uh, anybody else have any questions, comments? Dolly, what are you thinking? Any questions or comments? Anybody? I'm going to take this uh, thing, the PowerPoint off. There you are. How's everyone doing? You want to try to see we have a little bit of time, about 10 minutes. You want to try to draw? Your yes. Show us the uh, photo, that hand photo. No, just uh, the hand photo is. I'm just asking you to draw your. Let me see. Like your hand, you hold okay. it up like this. Okay. See, Adam's hand was like this. Mm -hmm. like, like this, right? This was Adam's hand in that uh, picture, creation of Adam. But what I want you to do is, I want you to turn it up like that, and then draw just this portion. So what I'm trying to tell you to do is just from here on up. So if I take out my watch and I draw from here on up, I want you to draw this because yesterday I sent you an email um, with, the, uh, with the PowerPoint. And in that PowerPoint, there is a YouTube link of a shading technique. So in that, I'll send it to you again as a separate clickable link. So in that, this girl has drawn a hand very beautifully with the shading technique. So what we wanna try to do is, when we are drawing a hand like this, 
you will see like there's a shadow here of this. Like if you put a if you put it under light, there's a shadow of my finger here. But I want to see like if we can draw this exactly. And to be able to draw these, you're going to take your pencil and you're going to draw the angle and then you're going to draw it like very little, little pieces. And then you'll connect the dots and see if you can make it exactly right. So one hand will be out like this, the other hand you're going to sketch. We'll, we'll just try to do that. Abigail is already drawing. Abigail, you wanna share with us what you're drawing? Come on, show it to the class. I'll take a picture just, too. I just erased it. <laughs> it wasn't turning out good. Uh, you just erased it? Yeah, it wasn't turning out good. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Will. Oh, wow. Look at you. Show me. I can't see. Okay. Oh, another thing for really little ones, what you can do is just take your hand, put it there, like so, and trace it. Okay. Can you do that? Take your hand, put it on the paper, and trace it. We can all do that. And then shoot it in. Okay. And then you can just shade it in. Yeah. It'll be a fun exercise to do. And keep your paintings coming in because I would really like for you to send it in. A lot of people are sending it in, but a lot more are not sending it in. And then when you take the pictures of the paintings, keep it flat on the on like this okay i'm going to show you how to take a picture then you take your phone here's your wait here's your phone right there's your art it's lying there take a picture right straight from above and then take a picture so now you have it a nice little picture. You click on it and you go hit the edit button right here, edit. And in the edit, you'll have a little square sign. Click on that. Okay. And then these lines will come up. So you take the lines such that all these things are taken off. Okay. Like so and like so, and then hit done. So now what you have is, there's no background. You see, I know you can't see it, but um, I'll try to take you some directions. Okay. All right, anybody else, any questions? No? Um, so I know I don't get any of the emails you send out. What's your email? Uh, I'll type it. I'll type it in the chat. Same here. I, don't get... I sent me too. Yeah, Sunita, I... Sunita has been sending me, but I'm not getting directly your email. Oh, okay. So I need, I need your emails. Let me write it down. Okay. It is D R like D yes. like that R like doctor. Yeah. P, P like frame. Yeah. Singla S I N G L A at gmail dot com. Okay. Let me see, open the chat up and trust in the oh. Lord all the time. Uh, Abigail, are you getting my emails? No. Trust in the Lord all the time at gmail.com. I have it. K Vaku, the Joe Ampong, are you not getting my emails? Hi, sir. We are getting your email through Sunita Ji. No, no, I'll send you a direct email. I'll, I'll include you. 
in the email, okay? You should get your own email at gmail.com. Okay. W-A-K-U-13-A at gmail.com. Then there's jesse.ampong2. at gmail.com and then Haley Grace Ilan. Haley, aren't you getting my emails? Haley Grace. Eleven twenty at gmail.com. Lindsay Kristen. Okay. Are there any other? Very nice. Okay, so thank you very much for joining in and we will talk to you all later. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, I said I have the hand like this. Oh, wonderful. Now you have to share, you have to okay. shave it in. That's very good. Now go ahead and shade it in, okay? With what color? Can I show it? Yes. Nice. Yes. Hi. Very nice. Very nice. Every so which color we should use for hand? Just uh, do the shading with the black graphite pencil. Okay. Huh? okay. Just so that you will uh, practice it with the bra black graphite pencil. Okay. Abigail, you Thank want you. to post your progress? Oh, look at that, Persos. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Very good, Abigail. Very good, Persos. Very, very good. I'm so proud of all of you. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Billy, I look forward to your sculpting. Oh, good job. And we are proud of Hyson. She has so yeah. much, yeah. So much patience. Yeah, Hyson. <laughs> So okay. much patience. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Evan and Mason's mom. And thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Yes. See you yes. tomorrow. Uh, Kusum and uh, Saroj, can you give me your emails? Saroj? Yeah. Kusum? Kusum, you have to ask me one minute. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. S A R O J Saroj uh -huh. underscore A underscore A A for Agarwal A underscore A at yahoo.com Okay and Saroj underscore A at, at yahoo.com yahoo. okay. okay. Tell me yours uh, Should I tell? Yes. KP underscore Kusum. Underscore Kusum. At yahoo.com. Okay. Uh, when I send you the email, make sure you reply back so I know that you got it. Okay? Sure. Okay. 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 I will send you all the PowerPoints and uh, all the instructions again so that everybody gets it. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Sounds okay. good. Thank you. All right, Dolly, you have any questions? No. Any questions, Dolly? We are only question. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you, Rita. Thank you. <laughs>